All right, good afternoon. Um, thank you all for being here. My name is Nate Mosier. I'm the department head in agricultural and biological engineering. It's my great uh, pleasure to introduce our next speaker this afternoon, I guess just barely afternoon, uh, Dr. John Jin. Uh, Dr. John Jin was, uh, uh, comes, comes to us and into a professorial role in kind of a unique pathway, and maybe he'll speak to that a little bit, but uh, he's someone we uh, recruited from industry who was very interested in very practical problems in solving a very profound global challenge, right? We have limited land, we have changing weather patterns, and we have growing human populations. So how do we continue to increase agricultural productivity to continue feeding the human population and maintain our environment, right? Do this sustainably into the future. And so um, that was the heart of the former company that John was working for, um, Pioneer. So the working on trait development for the crops that we grow that provide the food that we ate for lunch today. And uh, we encouraged him to maybe have an opportunity here at Purdue University to think deeper about similar problems and how to apply his background, his knowledge across multiple domains. So I'm very happy he has some mentors joining us here from the College of Agriculture uh, that he's worked very closely with on, on solving real problems that are domain specific. Um, in the sciences that uh, engineers such as uh, Professor Jin can uh, uh, work on and, and, and move us forward in, in solving these global problems. So please join me in welcoming Dr. John Jin. Well, thank you very much, Nate. Uh, it's really my pleasure here to be here today. It's uh, really exciting to see some of the collaborators, college leaders, and the young uh, graduate students. And I really want to say thank you, especially to uh, Marsha and Maria uh, for coordinating this event. So um, I'm a sensor developer for plant phenotyping. Um, and I realized that all the asso new associate professors are all thinking about the same thing when making the slides. We will start from the map here. So, uh, so I'm showing, the, showing you the world map here, uh, basically telling you the story uh, of how I come from Asia to Europe and then to the United States. Uh, and also how I uh, came from industry to academia. So uh, I was originally born in uh, Nantong, China, which is a city across the Yangtze River from Shanghai, uh, very close to Shanghai. So I used Shanghai Airport to fly to Chicago. It's kind of the symmetric uh, trip here. And uh, when I was 19 years old, I traveled not too far away, uh, 100 miles south of Shanghai to Hangzhou City and studied computer science in Zhejiang University. So uh, just for your information, Hangzhou is famous for this West Lake. Uh, many people say this is the most beautiful lake uh, in China. So I would recommend considering that. Because sometimes, you know, when you had a bad day sitting by the lake for about five minutes, everything is healed. So it's, uh, it's very, very beautiful. Uh, after my graduation, I traveled to Europe. Um, seriously, the Little Mermaid was one of the major reasons I chose to uh, travel to Denmark. But of course, we have a top-ranked uh, uh, te uh, technical university there. So I studied uh, computer engineering, so still in computer science or computer engineering zone. And after two years, I uh, came to Iowa State University and studied for my PhD degree for agriculture engineering. So I know this sounds a little unusual, uh, a student transferring from computer science, which is top rated in paying, uh, but now coming to agriculture. But I would like to say this is uh, one of the uh, wisest uh, decision I made in my life. Uh, basically, this gave me the opportunity to apply what I learned from computer science and computer engineering in a huge market, which is agriculture. So after graduation, after getting my degree, I joined uh, DuPont Pioneer. The company's uh, new name is Corteva. So uh, over there, I was an imaging scientist. So uh, of course, we worked on a lot of the projects, but the biggest project I worked on was the uh, I, le I led the development of the and the design of the imaging systems for DuPont Pioneers, uh, $40 million high throughput automatic phenotyping greenhouse facility. So uh, it was really a great opportunity for myself to gain some industry experience before coming to Purdue in 2015. So uh, when I just came to Purdue, I decided to continue the, the same work, which is to design the phenotyping systems. And uh, it was really exciting, but also busy and hardworking first three years. 
So every year we delivered one phenotyping system. So um, uh, as you can see from the pictures, the first one uh, is, the, is my first project using conveyor systems to deliver the plants through the hyperspectral imaging station, uh, automatically being scanned and we can predict nitrogen, uh, you know, or the nutrients, disease, and the water automatically. And many of the hardware and the software IPs were leveraged into the uh, College of Agriculture's AAPF facility, which is the second one. The third picture is um, uh, our second uh, greenhouse project. So basically we built this uh, gantry, the yellow gantry system, to play the role of a mock drone system. So we can simulate field remote sensing, drone remote sensing, in the greenhouse environment. And we actually uh, transferred this uh, system to the field, which is the last image. So this is our field phenotyping gantry in our acre uh, research farm. So uh, we used this facility uh, to learn, uh, and we get, get, uh, got a lot of the knowledges about how, for example, how the uh, diurnal changes and also the environmental condition variances severely impact our phenotyping results and how we can actually build models to calibrate those. So uh, anyway, these are the big and the expensive facilities. You know, we're very lucky at Purdue to have these facilities. But the one question is we also have so many plant scientists and we have 600 million farmers around the world. How do we allow more people to benefit from the advanced phenotyping uh, technology? So the idea is to put all the hardware and the software technologies into a small handheld device so it can be easy to use at any location for any type of applications. So uh, we made the first prototype product of LeafSpec, which is the first handheld hyperspectral leaf scanner. So as you can see from the video, it takes about three seconds to scan the leaf. And then from the smartphone, you can read the prediction of nutrients, disease, water. And each measurement is georeferenced. And uh, the leaf is a hyperspectral image. So today, of course, it's not a research seminar. I uh, just want to give you the big overview of this product. Um, so, and, and it, you can imagine that for this leaf spec, uh, it gives a very informative uh, image about how the crops are growing. Each pixel has hundreds of different colors, and we can have one millimeter spatial resolution. But this beautiful image doesn't make any sense to the farmers or to the plant scientists, because we need to predict the nutrients and the disease. We need to get the data. So that is another big part of my lab's work, which is to build all kinds of the image processing software and models to allow people to just take one scan and immediately you can get the information about the nutrients, drought, pathogen diseases, chemical impacts, and so on. So the software part is another big part of my research. Another the third part uh, is to develop robot technologies. Basically, you know, uh, we are sitting in a very comfortable room here, but if you go to the farm in the hot summer, the temperature, the moisture, the sharp blade of the leaves, it's really not friendly uh, for human to stay in the farm. So uh, our hope is to develop robots to automatically uh, do the field scanning with our advanced sensors to replace the human being. So for example, this is our new uh, drone-based robot called Dr. Fino. So it can fly to designated locations we program in the, in the software. And once it landed at one location, it, it can automatically use the machine vision to detect the top <coughs> matured leaf of the crop, either on soybean or corn. And then it uses the robotic arm to drive the leaf spec sensor to scan the leaf. And again, similarly, you can see the results uh, immediately from the smartphone app and it can fly to the next location. And then the next location is actually optimized by the software itself. Because every time we get the new data, the whole nitrogen map of the field is updated. And the software can actually decide on the best next location to uh, optimize the uh, efficiency of this uh, field scouting. So um, these are kind of the small summary, uh, brief summary of my research, so uh, just to also want to share with you that uh, industry re relationship is very important for my research. Um, uh, actually, most of my research funding is f coming from industry. Just a couple of examples. So for example, we developed the herbicide mode of action identification. So basically, you give me one plant, we can take one scan, and among 
dozens of different possibilities of different herbicide products. We can actually tell which herbicide you sprayed uh, based on the outlook of the leaves. So this model is uh, already adopted by uh, Sumitomo Chemical. It's a company in Japan uh, working on chemical products. And another second example is we also developed the wheat disease detection, the early detection algorithm, which helped the company of FMC to double the daily test throughput because we can see the disease symptom uh, much, much earlier than they are visible to human eyes. So um, commercialization is another part uh, of my life now. So uh, I was uh, strongly uh, encouraged by, by the university to commercialize some of the technologies. So uh, we founded this company, LeafSpec LLC, uh, in 2018. And this company uh, won the prize uh, of Davidson Prize in 2021. Um, so, uh, so this is just another big part of my life. And as you know, uh, as a full-time faculty, um, it's a big challenge for you to find enough time to really push the business going on while you still need to work on publication and teaching. Um, so that is why uh, I'm talking with a lot of the potential partners uh, to hopefully push this forward. Uh, we'll see how this goes. So that's commercialization part. Teaching, uh, so this is probably the one of the most uh, different part of my uh, career life here now, here compared with my industry, uh, industry job. So a lot of the memories, uh, if I go back to uh, four or five, five or six years ago, so the first picture is actually my first class. Uh, I created this new graduate level class, ABE 530, named the Plant Phenotyping Technologies. So we're really enjoying a lot of the discussion and uh, and then the second semester, I taught this uh, undergraduate class. Basically, uh, it's a um, uh, circuit design and uh, robotic class for all of our biological engineering students. So uh, it's really a lot of fun to interact with the young people there. Uh, and uh, actually, many of the students in the undergraduate class decided to follow, follow up with our lab and became our graduate students later. And uh, Picture on the upper right corner, uh, this is my lab uh, three years ago. So some students already left Purdue, some of them joined us. So uh, it's uh, another big part of my life here at Purdue. Every day uh, I interact with the students and we learn from each other and keep our uh, projects going on. So this is the teaching part. So thinking about the next 10 years or 20 years, uh, first of all, I would like to share my dream. So my biggest dream for my research is to close the loop of digital agriculture. So what does that mean? Um, you know, uh, agriculture is actually the least digitalized among all the major industries, according to the McKenzie Global Institute Digitalization Index. And also according to the McKenzie's report, another separate report, they expect the market for digital agriculture uh, to be $50 billion by 2030, which is just seven years, seven years later. Um, that is why investors are looking at digital agriculture and try to invest. And uh, many, many startup companies are fa were founded over the last years, and so many drones are flying uh, above the fields. Actually, this is not the slide. Actually, I would like to go to this slide. Many, many of the drones are flying around the field, but we see one issue. The issue is the farmers, they are not willing to pay the money out of their own pockets to these technologies. Taking Monsanto or Bayer's digital agriculture to the field of view, many of you might know field of view is a, a smartphone app. Field of view so far, mostly it's just like a happy box gift to farmers. It's very rare for me to see that the farmers are really using the field of view data and the information to make the decisions on when to fertilize, how much to fertilize, and when to uh, spray the, the herbicide, uh, when to spray the, 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 the chemical products. So uh, in my personal opinion, the bottleneck issue here is the sensor quality. It's exactly because our phenotyping, right now, our phenotyping sensors, we're suffering from a lot of the noises, including the daylight changing, the wind speed, the diurnal change of the crops. So among all the noise, the signal is embedded in, uh, is, is, is buried underneath the noise. 
So the quality is not good enough for the farmers to adopt these technologies and to make those decisions. So, uh, but on the other hand, I was also greatly encouraged by our recent data and experimental results. So I think I'm seeing the light at the end of the tunnel that the quality of the sensor is really improving and it's getting quite close to that level when we can close this loop so the farmers will really pick the data from our sensors and, uh, uh, and uh, make the decisions for the field operations. So uh, that is my biggest dream. So um, in order to pursue this dream, of course, we need to keep the research going on. But at the same time, uh, I think the team is really important. So that is why, uh, you know, over the last several years, we uh, had the Plant Science Initiative 1.0 and 2.0. A lot of the very good collaboration relation relationship has been formed. And uh, I think I'm seeing a great team here at Purdue. So we have people from the engineering college having very good technologies, and also people from the data scientists team having very good technologies. And also around our AB department, uh, south of the state street, we have so many, the world's greatest plant scientists, some of them are sitting here in this room. So they know the application, they know farmers, they know what is needed, what is a problem in the field. So I think um, AB should play the role, our engineers at AB should play the role to connect the groups together, and also we also would like to outreach to the outside people, uh, including you know the industry people from the Convergence Center, Purdue Foundry, and Purdue OTC. Uh, so to form a team to keep developing the new technologies and push the te technologies outside to impact the world. Finally, so I'm thinking about maybe for the next 10 years, 20 years, I will be very happy to maybe spend some of the time to maybe do a little bit of the leadership work, maybe through a center or through some additional collaboration projects to um, uh, work together with our uh, colleagues to move this forward. So I think um, this is my uh, kind of the review, and this is a really a good time for me to stop, think back, and recharge, and uh, find the new directions for the future. And I really appreciate uh, your uh, attend, uh, all of you attending this, this meeting here. I will be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Right, very good, some questions, Vilas. Very nice uh, demo. Uh, Thank you. Really impressive work. <clears throat> the question is, when you are trying to find out how much nitrogen you have in the plant, what is the scientific mechanism that nitrogen can be tracked and not other elements? So th this is a great question. It's a little technical. So <laughs> uh, brief answer is, uh, you know, generally the color of the leaf is a big reflector of nitrogen. So nitrogen amount, uh, the amount of nitrogen actually directly determine how much chlorophyll the plant can produce. And the more chlorophyll it can produce, you know, chlorophyll is a reason for the leaf to be green. So that is why we can take a picture of the leaf and by watching how green the leaf looks like, we can determine how much nitrogen it is. This is a basic level, and this is actually the standard method everybody is applying. However, I really like the second part of your question, how to differentiate between nitrogen and the other nutrients, like potassium, phosphorus, and others. Because all the other nutrients, including water even, they all help the plants to keep green. Lacking of the, all the other nutrients also hurts the green color of the leaf, and they become yellow. So that is why sometimes our existing models, we claim this model is a predictor of nitrogen, but actually it is impacted by the other, uh, by, by the other nutrients deficiencies. So a very, um, but the hope, I believe, stays in the, still in the sensor technology development. So for example, if we can combine, this is just one example, if we can combine the hyperspectral capability of the sensor and the spatial uh, resolution of the sensor. So uh, maybe some of you know this, but maybe um, some of you don't know. So for nitrogen deficiency, the yellowness and the loss of the chlorophyll actually start somewhere in the middle and the edge of the leaf. But for, sorry, uh, let, let's take corn for one example. The yellowness of the corn actually start to form when it lose nitrogen. 
But when the cone lose potassium, the yellowness start from the edge. So if we can combine the spatial resolution and the spectral resolution, this gives us the hope of differentiating between them. And uh, uh, we are very uh, lucky that uh, with leaf spec, we are probably the first group in the world who can combine hyperspectral and spatial resolution together so, so to move forward for a higher quality of the phenotyping. So. Other questions? Thanks. Um, you know, one thing I've always appreciated about your approach is you're thinking three, four, five generations ahead on the technology and what's going to be needed. You touched on a couple today, I think, that are maybe one or two. So I know you're thinking about the next three, four, or five. Anything you can share there about you know, what you're thinking the future holds in some of this area that uh, doesn't put you in a difficult spot with respect to ideas today? Are you talking about more like a research part? So um, sensor quality is, uh, is one part. Uh, and I think the digital technology to connect people together uh, is another big part of digital agriculture. So, um, and we see a lot of the practical values. Uh, for example, now in Indiana State, uh, dicamba pollution, dicamba drift is a big issue. Uh, yes, sensitivity to, to dicamba is one approach. But some warning signal ac across the neighborhood, the deliver of that warning signal from the government <coughs> to people uh, is also important. And that can be facilitated by a very mature the digital agriculture data infrastructure. So I think the combination of the sensor technology and the data infrastructure combined together can amplify this power and the value. So uh, I think the collaboration between the data scientists and the sensor developers, uh, this, is a, this is a very critical part for this. And I would also say that um, uh, maybe the commercial, commercialization side, how to keep finding new customers who can greatly benefit from this sensor is also important because that can help us to keep getting the funding from the outside world to facilitate our, our research. So uh, we're not only just talking about farmers, because let's take one example, the investors in Chicago future market. You know, these people, they make a profit by predicting how much corn and soybean people can produce. But you know what they are working on now? They are investing hundreds of dollars to those machine learning algorithms to take in the everyday news and the government policy to try, and also the environment and the climate change to try to predict three months later how much grain of the soybean and the corn will be on the ships, uh, on the ocean. But this is actually too slow, too late. And we can tell them, okay, we phenotyping people, we are actually the first to get the data in the field to predict even before the harvesting, we already got the data of how much yield people, are, are, uh, people will harvest. So uh, I think getting the interest of the many different disciplines of people and involve the whole community into this and keeping uh, seeking the new applications and the customers can really grow this community and uh, uh, help everybody to grow together in this. I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> yeah, so I, I hear very interesting story that you have a very nice technology but the farmers may not be paid for them uh, by themselves. Uh, in the non-ag side of engineering, we have a very similar problem. So over the industrial 4.0 requirements, small and mid-sized companies cannot afford the transition. They cannot even afford to buy the app. Some of the app is really expensive. So even they know that they're facing getting eliminated by the industrial 4.0, they still cannot afford to go through the technology upgrade. And we have a very large group of people working on this subject. So I think they will be, uh, can be very helpful uh, with you as well. So afterwards, I'll be happy to connect you with that group of people. Well, we'll be happy to. Thank yeah. you. Nice talk. Man. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for one quick question, if there's one more. I was intrigued by what uh, Jiang you're saying about uh, field of view <coughs> uh, adoption by farmers. 
Um, so your contention, I mean, is there research that shows that it is the inaccuracy of the sensors that's driving, or what, I mean, what are the things, uh, I mean, field of view is pretty much what's available. Um, what are the other, what are you seeing there at that interface between you know uh, what farmers need and is it just is it just that inaccuracy or other other factors also? Well, uh, we have um, agriculture experts here, uh, but uh, my my personal view is my understanding of farmers. Sometimes I talk with farmers as well. My understanding is farmers they they have a very practical way of thinking. Uh, no matter how cool, how fancy the technology looks like, that's not appealing to farmers. You need to show the farmers that in real practice, this technology can really help them to earn money. By the end of the year, you know, compared with last year when I didn't use this technology, and now I use this technology, I earn 5,000 more dollars this year. This, will, this is probably the only reason we can persuade the farmers to, to invest into these, these things. So, uh, so that is why I think um, uh, we, and this, how to turn the key, how to start this, uh, this uh, practice is, is a big challenge. So I think this is a role of a university in academia. I think it is our job. Uh, we should not just uh, try to advertise and persuade the farmers to use something, but we should do this experiment. We should uh, do this experimental things and collect data and show the proof that, see, if you do this, you will earn money. We already did this. Now everybody follow us. So I think this is a one role of a land-ground university. Um, and this is ex exactly what we are doing. We have, a, we have a research farm here near campus, uh, 1,600 acres. And we have five uh, Purdue research, agricultural <coughs> research centers. And we are doing this every year. So I think um, uh, through our extension uh, team, maybe, getting closer to the farmers. And by the way, most of the farmers think in one way, but we also have some pioneer farmers. And we can also collaborate all of those pioneer farmers who is willing to be the first, be the, you know, we call it innovators and frontiers to take this, these technologies to, to show this uh, future map. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jin. Uh, thank please you very much. just join me in thanking him again. <laughs>